Hello, everybody. My name is Ryan Rice. I am the membership coordinator here at Freedom of the Press Foundation, and I wanted to welcome you to another membership event. Um, we've done a few trainings uh, and kind of resource-based things in the past, and this is the first time we're looking into one of our active projects. So I'm excited to kind of dig into this stuff. Um, this will be recorded and available in the membership events archive uh, afterwards. As always, you can ask questions in the q and I'll be monitoring that or you can send messages to me at membership at freedom.press. Um, I want to thank our participants, uh, managing editor Kirsten McCutton and senior reporter Stephanie Sugars. Thank you both for joining me and talking about the US Press Freedom Tracker. So without further ado, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, hello members, thank you so much for supporting Freedom of the Press Foundation. Uh, your support is incredible. I'd also like to give a special welcome uh, to the newsletter subscribers. Uh, we open this up to include for this webinar only those who um, subscribe to the Press Freedom Tracker newsletter. Uh, it's monthly, I do write it, and uh, you hear a lot about everything from how my March Madness brackets are doing, but mostly it's about the state of press freedom in the United States. Um, I can't wait to introduce my co-host here. Uh, you've met Ryan. We're gonna tell you about the US Press Freedom Tracker. This is a project of Freedom of the Press Foundation launched in 2017. So we're in our seventh year of documentation and the site itself is a database. It's a news database that collects virtually every press freedom violation in the US. What does that mean? It's journalists report, uh, reporting and arrested, uh, journalists assaulted while doing their work, receiving a subpoena for private confidential source information or for testimony. Uh, we track across nearly a dozen categories uh, across the United States. And I know those went kind of fast, uh, but you will have a chance to see them again. And they're also on our, those quotes are on our uh, Twitter feed. So you can always find them if something piqued your interest. We track across all of these categories uh, in order to give a good view of what's happening in the United States around press freedom. And the longer the database has been around, the greater you get to compare year over year, day over day, month over month, uh, press freedom trends. Uh, we do cover breaking news all the way down um, to following something that happened in 2017. Let's say a journalist was arrested and maybe it takes years for those charges to be dropped. We keep following them. Uh, maybe that journalist sues and we track that as well. You're gonna get to hear all the dirty details, the very deep metadata. Um, but first I'm gonna give you this, what I like to call forest, and then we're gonna go into the trees and then you get to ask some questions. Um, so next, we're going to see what the homepage is of the U.S. Press Freedom Tracker. That's pressfreedomtracker.us. Uh, if you have not been here to play around, it is a very user-friendly site. It is interactive, um, and you will see that on the next slide, how you can go to the homepage and click year over year. Um, right? Yeah, could you show uh, this little video and... I hope you can see okay. What we're doing here is just changing year over year. And you can see the categories we track across, arrest, assaults, uh, a prior restraint. That's a news outlet being told they cannot publish under uh, threat of punishment. We track those, um, where they're happening, how frequently they're happening, and, uh, and when as well. Thanks. Then on the next slide, we're going to see, boop, you gotta hit it in. Um, I know it swings in from the side. Well, this is where I get to turn it over to senior reporter, Stephanie Sugars. Uh, I have to warn you, she loves the data uh, and the metadata, and we're going to go now into what I call the trees. So um, Stephanie, can you say hello to everybody and uh, tell us what's inside? Yes, hi, thank you for joining us everyone. And Kirsten is in no way lying when she says, I love the trees, I love the weeds, I love making spreadsheets. And so I'll, I'll try not to get too deep into it. But um, so on the next slide, uh, you'll see just a quick snapshot of what it 
actually looks like inside the database. So the sorts of cases that we're documenting range from uh, the smaller cases that you may not have heard of, such as a student journalist who was covering a major basketball game earlier this month. Um, and as he was filming a team leave the court after a brutal loss, uh, one of the university staff members grabbed his phone from his hand and threw it. Um, so from that sort of smaller scenario to major national news, such as the tragic shooting of two Spectrum News 13 journalists down in Florida in last month. Um, and if you look towards the bottom of those two cases, which are on the left, uh, you see highlighted in yellow, shot, shot at, and killed tags. Um, unfortunately, reporter Dylan Lyons did die of his injuries. Uh, Jesse Walden is thankfully recovering really well, but uh, I'm, I'm pointing out those tags because it, it is another way that you were able to navigate through the database and find the most, um, or find some of the most interesting trends over time and really get a, a sense of the pulse of what is are the major issues that journalists are facing. So taking a quick look at that, uh, one of the most common tags that we end up using is protests. Across all years, protests are routinely the most dangerous place for reporters and photojournalists. And so this gives you a sense, wait for it, 2020, madness. Um, but uh, it give, you can use a variety of our tags, which include, yes, killed, shot, protest, um, white nationalism, environmentalism, reproductive rights, um, covering every topic basically that journalists cover. And so if you dive into the database itself, uh, it looks a little bit like this. And you're able to filter from, by date, by location, um, by type of incident that you're looking at, whether that is an arrest or an assault, uh, chilling statements, or you can even search by the journalist's name or the outlet they work for. So uh, this is what it looks like if you search for Jeff German, who it was a Las Vegas Review Journal investigative reporter who was killed outside of his home in September. Um, and there are two cases because not only uh, did we document his assault, but we've also been following along as the Review Journal has been fighting the seizure of a myriad uh, or myriad electronic devices from his phone as part of that investigation. And so if we click into one of those cases, you get an idea of what it looks like where it has all of that metadata um, and then all of the details we have of the case from most recent to, uh, or from newest to oldest. Um, and that circles back to something that Kirsten mentioned and that I think is one of the best value adds of the trackers, the centralized, repository of information on each individual case that we follow along as not only from the incident itself, but as individuals are arrested for assaulting a journalist, as uh, their equipment is finally released from police custody. Um, and so follow it through time. And also, for example, with the next slide, you'll see, uh, as Kirsten was mentioning, the what happens with arrests, which are always some of the most complicated and long-term uh, sorts of cases. And so you, if you take a quick peer at this, you'll see that uh, there were three different charges against April Ehrlich, who was arrested in September of 2020. And the last of those charges were only dropped in August of this year. And so we followed as she finally got body camera footage released. Uh, and as those charges were dropped, and then most recently when she has filed a lawsuit trying to hold the city accountable for not only arresting her, but pursuing those charges for as long as they did. And so one of the things that uh, we hope everyone does using these weeds that I lovingly co collect and curate for you uh, is uh, these sort of analyses into the trends of, and what is the state of press freedom in the US. We do a bit of this ourselves, as mentioned, Kirsten, the illustrious writer of our 
monthly newsletters, which go out at the end of each month, um, as well as these long form deep dives into either a specific uh, trend that we're seeing, such as the financial burden, especially for independent and freelance journalists covering protests when their equipment is damaged, to our sort of yearly analyses on major categories, namely arrests, and the trends that we're seeing there, and such as last year, where we noticed there more journalists were still facing charges than were even arrested in 2022. Uh, and the concerning nature of those long-term sort of swords of Damocles over journalists' head. Back to Thanks, you. Stephanie. Um, you know, that those analyses are a good point and we're gonna build on that uh, when you take a look at the other ways that the tracker is used. So we do write, uh, original analyses using tracker data. In some ways, it's because we are so close to it and uh, we can really see things as a team over time. What you're seeing here is how the tracker data in the wild, how it's used. And Jennifer, I see your uh, question. It's a great question. This speaks to that as well. And Jennifer's question is, how is the tracker used in advocacy campaigns and policy work? The tracker is used by journalists. Um, by academics, by researchers, uh, by the public, uh, and in policy. Uh, this, these are a few places where it has been quoted. Um, you know, and sometimes we'll say names of specific journalists uh, that, uh, that have come through the tracker. And if you are here, uh, just know that um, we're using, that we talk about your case and we think about you. Uh, one reporter I'm thinking about is Andrea Sohori. She was arrested as part of the 2020, while covering a 2020 protest. Her charges were not dropped and they took her to trial. And um, during that time period, as, we, as the city was gearing up to take her to trial, would not drop the charges. Uh, major groups were calling, uh, every group was calling, advocacy group was calling uh, for those charges to be dropped. She was identified herself as a reporter at the time. Uh, she was with Des Moines Register at the time. She's moved on. And the tracker was cited more than a hundred times in about a one month period or less, uh, because not only did we know how many, could you look at the database and find out how many journalists had been arrested, um, like Andrea Sohori, how many were still facing charges. And we also could tell from the data how many had gone to trial. And that kind of information only exists here. And it's used in major advocacy campaigns, uh, which affect policy uh, day in, day out. Um, from here, you know, the and it's open source, um, all of Freedom of the Press Foundation, open source software. Uh, we encourage you to, if, if data tracking uh, is something that uh, you would like to look into. It has a downloadable API, so you can filter and use the data as you want um, and also use it as a backbone. So we were really excited. Uh, we got to work closely with the um, Canada Press Freedom Project, which just launched in December, thank you, uh, of 2022, so just a few months ago. And uh, it really did a nice job of, of acknowledging how much of it was built from the work of the tracker. And uh, you have to give credit, an incredible web team here. So the tracker is a project of Freedom of the Press Foundation, which you support. Uh, and while the team is small, it is supported by the entire foundation. Um, you know, we're just talking data visualizations with web today that keeps these things working for you. Uh, membership that it all works together at FPF. Um, here's a good one. Go ahead and make it. Yeah. Okay, stay informed. Do you want me to? Um, we're going to show you all the places you can find us. Stephanie, you want to talk about it? Yeah. So we ex try to exist in all of the spaces where journalists do, not only because they're our people, but because they are also our sources and our audience um, it's for so many cases. So we're on Twitter still, um, and you can find the most recent cases that we are documenting, as well as really helpful reminders that if you experience a press freedom aggression, we want to hear about it. And we accept tips in both English and Spanish. And then we're very excited to announce that just earlier this year, we finally launched a Instagram account, uh, which allows us to better reach visual journalists who may more or less only exist on that platform. 
Oh, it's my favorite part. Um, it's an ask us anything. So it's an AUA, but um, please feel free to put them, raise your hand I or I think it might just be in the chat. Um, and Jennifer, your question was uh, with policy change, um, how is data used? And if you want to build from that, please do put it, uh, put more in the chat. Anybody is welcome to that. Um, my question for you both is, I guess it kind of has to do with current events. Um, I saw in multiple headlines, the Wall Street journalists arrested in Russia. Um, I know we're called the US Press Freedom Tracker. Um, that doesn't mean we, we don't care about these uh, incidents that don't happen here. But could you comment on that as well as kind of the niche that the Press Freedom Tracker occupies within reporting on American reporters? Definitely. Um, yeah, it was news, hard news that we all woke up to today. And uh, I think all, all of our thoughts are with uh, the reporter. And that's where, as a foundation, the multiple projects work together, um, the advocacy team, uh, the our digital security training team together with the tracker. So while the Wall Street Journal reporter won't go into the tracker because it wasn't by US government on you know, in the US or territories. And that is a, a special geographic niche of, of the tracker. Um, the, but we're all aware and you know, the tracker is built on, uh, supported by nearly two dozen organizations. And many of those work in that space, Ryan, of uh, the, the globally focused documentation. Did that get uh, The other get question I had that? was about, um, I think Stephanie, you mentioned our audience and our source or, and our uh, sources are, are both journalists, right? It's, it's often like they can be the center of the story even while they're reporting on something else. Um, could you talk about kind of that process of talking with these folks as sources and kind of an audience? Yeah, so uh, of course, just as journalists, uh, we all care deeply about what the state of press freedom is in the United States um, and how that is going to affect us and our peers and our workplaces. Um, it's one of the largest challenges that I face in my daily reporting is convincing journalists who've most often been trained that they're not supposed to be the center of the story, that it's still worthwhile for them to talk to me about what they've experienced. Because if we are unable to actually express what the problem is, we don't have the numbers to say, no, there are more and more arrests happening. There are more and more subpoenas then it is impossible for us to actually affect change to improve the state of press freedom. And that's really the reason why the tracker was founded in the first place, that we didn't have any ground to really stand on to make arguments for improving and defending and strengthening the First Amendment in this country. So journalists should, you don't, don't be the center of your stories, but, but please be the center of mine if something happens to you, please talk to us. Um, I think I mentioned in the intro email about this event, my, my experience working with you all in the summer of 2020 during all those protests. Um, we greatly expanded our tags and our metadata during that summer. Um, and I know just recently last year, we had a whole redesign of the website to make it more interactive using that data. Um, can you talk about how reporters use this, how you hope folks use this in the future? Yeah. And, uh, in case you're not aware of what to what Ryan is referring, um, in late May of 2020, uh, when George Floyd was murdered, protests broke out across the nation, uh, and journalists covered those protests. And the response to journalists covering those protests, they were met with uh, assaults, arrests, the likes of which the the United States and the and the tracker had not seen. Um, we were inundated uh, with information from across the US and uh, worked day and night to 
pull it all in um, a famous, like a little famous story that our executive director, Tim, was running the the Twitter oh, like overnight uh, when the, this was happening because we were trying so hard to let the public know what we were seeing as the tracker while also verifying, um, doing full reporting, uh, editing, and putting the data in so we had something to measure against. Um, and that is uh, from, that was through 2020. And so whenever you hear somebody reference the spike of 2020, more than 140 journalists were um, arrested in 2020, which was more than all the other years of the tracker data combined. Um, to date, there's still 200 and something. So that 2020 really uh, sticks out across almost every category, certainly assaults and arrests. Uh, so Ryan, you know, your reference to, to 2020 is uh, just putting that into a little bit of context. And then Stephanie, do you want to keep building from there? Actually, you go ahead, you go ahead. I'm, <laughs> I'm not organizing my thoughts well. Well, Ryan, you're asking about the, uh, the metadata and uh, the place that it, sorry, I thought I saw another question come through. Um, the, you know, the place that it holds. So the building of it has been so important. Uh, when we look back that while the fact that it now it's in its seventh year of documentation um, means that you're able to compare year over year. So while we might know of a certain spike at a certain time, um, uh, we can also now go back to what Stephanie was saying, uh, use this to put the state of press freedom in the US really in context for others who are going to use it. I do think that's important, the um, database of hard facts that we're building here. Um, before the tracker existed, people kind of guesstimated that that folks were getting assaulted or, or subpoenaed or their stuff, uh, cameras broken on the border. Um, but now that we are actually tracking it, um, I think that's the first step towards kind of shifting policy and kind of holding um, politicians' feet to the fire when when this type of stuff happens. Yeah, and you know the part of the origin story for the tracker uh, it goes back to 2014 um, protests in Ferguson, Missouri, and uh, journalists were being arrested and assaulted while covering those protests, and. Uh, there was no one place, there was no one database where somebody could look and say, oh, this journalist, two dozen journalists were arrested over those protests. And if you look back at old FPF freedom.press blog posts, there's one uh, blog post where uh, it was written in and, and somebody here started organizing uh, together with uh, a coalition started just writing down the names of journalists who had been arrested in Ferguson. And it's one of my, it's a really great origin story of realizing, are we all using the same language? And how, how can that language be backed up by numbers? And the, the tracker brings that to every advocacy group. Uh, it brings that to academic research. It brings it to policy. It really holds as a news nonpartisan database, a, a special place. Well, thank you both for explaining the US Press Freedom Tracker. Um, I think y'all are doing some excellent work um, tracking these things because no, no one else is. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to submit them to me at membership at freedom.press. This video will be up in the archives soon. Um, and you can comment there as well. Any closing thoughts, Kirsten or Stephanie, um, other than thank you for, for, for being here. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. And, thank, and thank you to everybody who uh, came today. We really uh, appreciate your support of the tracker and of Freedom of the Press Foundation. Thanks, bye all.